You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 94, for September 28th, 2016. I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we talk about the laws and regulations behind the Dakota Access Pipeline Environmental Assessment. So, pack a bag because we're going to North Dakota and because the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today are Stephen in Calgary, Hello. Sonia in Utah, Hello. Doug in Scotland, Hi. and Chris in Oregon. Hi. All right, so just so everybody knows, if uh, Sonia suddenly drops out of the conversation, she does have to leave uh, a little bit early for this recording today because she has so many volunteer activities she's doing today. She's that awesome, so she's going to go from one to the next. <laughs> so Sorry, everyone. Right, right. Um, so on this show, we're going to start out by talking, and, and we may finish this way, who knows, um, but we're going to start out by talking about the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, I feel like we have to at this point. Uh, I feel like we would be remiss not even just mentioning it. Now, I will start by saying a lot of what we'll say, you know, we're we're also getting just from from common public sources um, because there isn't there isn't really a lot of in depth information out there unless you really talk to the people involved in this. But since it's still going on, um, you know, it's probably difficult to get them to to get anybody on to this little tiny podcast until it's all said and done. We might do that later, but. What I wanted to do with this episode right now is to just give the basic facts on this. Um, you know, what's going on, what happened, you know, maybe maybe what's going on from here, and then we can use our knowledge and experience of these laws and regulations that are in place to um, to kind of unpack it a little bit and and figure out, you know, maybe what we would have done in those situations or, or something like that. You know, we'll just we'll just see where it goes. So. Um, the basics of this are, and again, this is a very huge, glossy overview, so don't take me to task on details right now, but um, basically, this is a pipeline project um, running through a couple states, and uh, the basics are it goes under lakes and waterways, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as just a thing. I mean, that's what it does, because there's lots of waterways out there, and part of what invokes their federal permitting is when it, when lakes and navigable waterways are involved, that brings in the Army Corps, okay? So they need an Army Corps permit. Um, I, in fact, just did a really tiny housing development project last year in Reno that had one tiny drainage that hasn't had water in it for years, but it's still listed as a waterway, uh, a U.S. waterway. So uh, it invoked an Army Corps permit, which, you know, it's pretty strict stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, the basics are the Army Corps was required to give the permit, and uh, the Standing Rock Truce Sioux Tribe um, says that they weren't properly consulted, and they weren't, uh, because as part of Section 106, also involved with this, um, they were they were supposed to be consulted, and not just doing the archaeology. Doing the archaeology is easy. Anybody can walk out there, or any firm that knows what they're doing can walk out there, you know, do their survey, do their shovel testing, whatever they had to do, and and find archaeological sites. But in an area like that, you really need to talk to the active tribe in the area because it's not just the artifacts and the things on the ground that are sacred to them. It's also it's also sometimes the areas or the waterways involved or the lake that is involved that is their primary source of water, um, things like that. So they weren't consulted on this stuff adequately, according to them. And that's where a lot of this, uh, this uproar is taking place. So um, and also not only that, but a lot of the stuff that was theoretically found um is being destroyed by bulldozers so um people have mentioned again this is all hearsay people have mentioned you know seeing this happening as the bulldozers started running a couple weeks ago and uh and they're obviously very concerned about that so um all right so sonia you have read uh, a couple of the um pertinent documents relating to this um what were those documents and and what did you what did you get out of those and we'll talk about that from there Okay, the first thing that I started with when I when I heard first heard about the Dakota Access Pipeline was the EA, the draft EA, and the final EA. Now let's uh, which is let, let's unpack acronyms too. Oh, I'm sorry. The draft environmental assessment, mm -hmm. which is a federal document addressing um, uh, resources, all resources along the along the proposed corridor, mm -hmm. um, and then the final environmental assessment or EA, or also called a FONSI finding of no significant impact. So the, both of these documents uh, can be found on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers website. If you're interested in taking a look, you can go there. 
Um, Chris, I sent you a couple of links, so hopefully you'll be able to post those in the show notes. Yep, we'll get those in the show um, notes for sure. Just search for cultural resources um, in both of those documents. They are searchable PDFs. Mm -hmm. So the, the first things that I did was start to review what actually, what actually was going, uh, going on in the environmental document. First thing I noticed is that uh, the draft EA uh, was prepared by Dakota As Access Pipeline. I do not know. Um, if it was prepared by one of their consultants. Um, the second, um, and cultural resources sections in the draft EA um, starts, ooh, I would say, I think it's on like page 55 mm -hmm. um, of the draft. Um, it basically states that cultural resources inventories were done in compliance with section 106 on federal lands. Um, private property was not surveyed for cultural resources. Mm -hmm. um, and additionally, this EA only addresses, as far as I'm aware, North Dakota. It does not address the, uh, the other states that were involved, that are involved in this thousand mile pipeline project. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is uh, they did consult with the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Um, they actually said that the process, uh, process was initiated by the Army Corps um, in November of 2014. Mm -hmm. They do have a programmatic agreement, um, and let's see. Uh, let, um, let's see here. Uh, the Standing Rock Sioux, um, as I understand it, um, mentioned that um, there were no, no cultural resources of of significance in the project area. Hmm. That said, the uh, the Standing Rock Sioux and the um, and the ACH, ACHP in the draft EA. Um, uh, did have concerns, and um, it was noted in those documents that there were concerns. Mm -hmm. But the but the uh, Army Corps did issue a, a FONSI, a finding of no significant impact, basically saying that no historic properties, and a historic property is an eligible archaeological so site or um, historical structure. Um, so no historic properties affected mm -hmm. uh, by the project, and. Um, Let's see, the final decision was sent to the ACHP in 2016, and uh, uh, the, the agency decision, let's see, they affirmed the agency decision and uh, fulfilled uh, USACE, which is the Army Corps, a Section 106 responsibilities for the action. So mm -hmm. I know I'm, I'm dropping a lot of acronyms and a lot of words. <laughs> so basically they're saying that um, the, the Section 106 was fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, as I also understand it, they uh, they did do literature searches for the private property um, instead of uh, archaeological surveys, which were just done on federal property. Right. And um, and uh, at one point, the Sioux said that there weren't any um, archaeological sites of significance. Now, that's not what we're hearing in the news. So, based on what I'm reading in the EA, it's slightly it differs slightly than what's in what's coming out in the news. So mm -hmm. I don't know what the truth is here. Um, the concern is it was it was pointed out that the Standing Rock Sioux and the uh, and the um, ACHP um, were both concerned about cultural resources as they should be. Um, the the this document only covers North Dakota, um, and it doesn't it doesn't cover the uh, the other states involved, right. which suggests that they were piecemealing um, portions of this thousand mile pro uh, long project. Um, usually, what happens with these projects? Usually, not always, as in this case. This case, um, the entire project is considered. Um, the, the, all the different states are considered connection, connected actions. Even private property sections are considered a, a connected action to a, a federal undertaking. And a federal undertaking in this case is um, uh, this project because it uses either federal money or federal permits. The permit here is um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers nationwide permit number 12. That permit and uh, f uh, forgive me, I'm opening opening up here because I want to get you an exact quote. Mm -hmm. Nationwide permits, number 12, are a type of general permit designed to authorize certain activities that will have a minimal impact and cumulative adverse effect on the aquatic environment and generally comply with related laws cited in 
33 CFR 320.3. So because uh, now, now normally a nationwide permit number 12 is used for transmission lines and access roads. Why it was used on a, um, on a pipeline project is unknown to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I was not involved in the, pro, uh, in the project, so I don't understand why, at this point, why it was used. Right. So now that I've spoken, <laughs> what do you think of all of these things? Right. Well, you know, I want to I want to go back to the EA real quick too, um, the draft EA anyway, and say, uh, you know, there's a there's section three point seven point one cultural resource studies. Um, it even says right here, you know, uh, basically I'll I'll paraphrase here, but it says based on um, compiled data from previously executed archaeological investigations. They recognize that the area, the entire region, has been inhabited by human populations for approximately 12,000 years. Um, and they go on to say multiple sites have been explored that suggest the area is inhabited by societies um, adapted for lifestyles on the plains, um, dating back to at least uh, 6,000 years in this state, or 6,000 BC. Um, current project areas, current project areas, have a moderate to high probability for archaeological deposits based on proximity to permanent water sources, topography, lack of significant ground disturbances, and depositional processes. So I guess my question without, again, um, you know, they, they have a lot of stuff in here about uh, different sites and things like that. But I guess I, I wonder if this, if and again, this is opinion. Um, I don't know any of the facts on this, but I wonder if this comes down to, um, you know, we, we've done lots of projects where we find based on the available evidence and the regulations that we're supposed to employ by the agency we're working for on what defines a site and um, uh, what defines the significance of a site as it pertains to its eligibility for listing on the National Register for Historic Places. Uh, you know, were a lot of the sites determined by the archaeological firms that did this to be not eligible? Um, and, and that would be my question, because they usually if it's determined not eligible, and they did their consultation properly, and everything is still determined not eligible, and they go with that, well, then bring on the bulldozers. That's usually what they say. Um, so my thinking is, or my question is, I wonder if, I wish we could talk to somebody here, but I wonder if, um, you know, they they found all this stuff, they determined it wasn't eligible, but they didn't do a proper cons consultation, because not eligible to us from a data standpoint is completely different to the Native Americans that govern that area. That might be completely 100% significant to them, but according to our data strict determination of it, it's not eligible um, and it's not significant. But, uh, and that's usually, I mean, quite often that's what these, what these agencies go by. Um, and then if they do consultation, then that has to bring that in. So um, I don't know, what do you guys think? Stephen, you're mentioning incidental fines in the background there. Yeah, um, you know, just because something's uh, determined to be not eligible, um, there are still issues with incidental fines. If you know, for sure, monitoring. It turns, it turns into, yeah, well, yeah, if it turns into burials or some something like that. Um, uh, one, one of my earlier back channel questions, um, you know, and this I'll toss to Sonia. Sorry, um, mm -hmm. is. Uh, you know, it seems like this pipeline is or was triggered um, for 106 review because it, you know, kept crossing like uh, core jurisdiction, you know, like the stream crossings and and stuff like that. But, um, you know, what it, what normal what normally triggers a uh, pipeline? Because uh, you, Sonia, you were talking about, uh, you know, generally we, you know, we tend to review these things as an entire, you know, package. Usually, uh, the Section 106 process uh, for pipeline is initiated by um, federal permitting, which, of course, in this case, is the Army Corps of Engineers. But also, I'm I'm a little curious to know, and maybe this is my um, misunderstanding, why FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, it isn't involved in this. And maybe they are, and I just haven't read it. Um, but usually, FERC oversees... Uh, um, some of the environmental as well. Um, so, so anytime, Sonia, I know they're, I know they're involved when they, like, uh, any sort of dams or hydroelectric is involved as well, but that's not the case here. Or, or is that just because the pipeline's involved? Do you think they would be, um, I thought it was because the pipeline was involved. Right. Right. Um, I don't it know. Was a, it, because it's a pipeline, but maybe not. Um, it, in this case, um, 
the Section 106 process was initiated because of the Army Corps, and that's why the Army Corps has taken the lead on this project. Um, and maybe FERC isn't involved at all. I, I don't know. I haven't really looked that far into it. Um, but if they're crossing um, regulated um, drainages, waters of the U.S., in this case, um, lakes and rivers, um, the, the Army Corps is going to be involved. So Section 106 applies. And again, we're, we're talking about, I mean, we can't be, just be talking about one stream crossing or one, one lake. We've got to be talking about multiples, which is why I was curious that there's just, as far as I'm aware, only one EA for one state, <laughs> and they've seemed to have piecemealed a project. Now, please be aware, I am not involved with this project in no way. So all I have access to is what I've, I've been able to Google. And, and I'm not talking about news reports here because I'm not entirely sure how many news stations actually understand what an EA is. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, but I, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm a little confused by what's going on. Um, but again, I'm not intimately involved with it. I'm not on the project. I was not one of the archeological firms out there doing surveys. I wasn't consulting. So I'm looking at this from the outside. Did I answer your question? <laughs> it, it also seems like, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of what's mentioned in the cultural resource section of the EA is dealing with past um, past surveys. So new archaeology was possibly not done for this, which is also uh, a valid thing because there uh, so much so much work has been done out in eastern North Dakota um, because of the uh, the Bakken oil, um, the Bakken, uh, the use of the Bakken oil. What's that called? Reserve? Something like that? Anyway, um, you know, they, they had a huge ramping up of activity out there. So maybe a lot of areas have been just incidentally surveyed. Um, and, and then if it was in the la within the last 10 years, at least in Nevada, then, you know, they can go back to, the, to those surveys and they don't have to necessarily re-record. A lot of places will just resurvey the whole area and then make, you know, uh, make statements about the previously recorded sites. But... Um, it sounds like for some of the stuff, at least in the EA, that they just went back towards the uh, back to the uh, the previous surveys that had been done. Now, if those surveys were really old, then they'd have to resurvey the area and just use those as a as a as a guideline document. But um, other than that, I don't know. An EA should state that if that's the case. If that uh, you know uh, prior work was considered to be adequate, then no additional uh, work was required for this project. That that should be in the EA. Yeah, and I think I think it is in uh, in that one section that I read um, three point seven. I'm trying to find it again here. Uh, it does mention cultural resource background studies and field surveys were conducted um, uh, right there, and then it says based on data compiled from previously executed archaeological archaeological investigations. That's where they got some of their background history. Now I don't know if they got all their background. Like you know, they said okay, that's cool. There's nothing here, or there is stuff here. Not really sure, but um, yeah, again. You know, we're just going off the documents we have. So um, I don't know. So what I was told, and this is so this is based off of, you know, just a conversation. So take it with a grain of salt, is that the permit 12 allows for the segmentation of the process. So, uh, Sonia, while you were talking about how you were surprised it would only be in North Dakota, my understanding is of the reason they may have done with permit 12 which is supposed to be doing electrical lines and not a pipeline is that it allowed them to skip um, doing each. So, you know, typically the evaluation would be the entire, was it a thousand mile long pipeline? Does anyone actually know the length of the pipeline? Yeah, it was like 1100 miles. Yeah. 1100 miles. And so, I mean, typically if, if this was a typical project, the whole pipeline would be considered the whole area. I mean, I've I've worked for companies that have done pipeline projects that stretch across you know the state of New Mexico, and the whole area was surveyed, even across private property. Um, but I was told that because of Permit 12, they were able to chunk it up so that you didn't have to do the whole 1,100 miles. And I think that's what's causing a lot of the issues is that essentially they've chunked it up and they've said, oh, there's nothing in this little chunk right here that affects our little area. 
and then ignored. And, and this is, you know, just again, a conversation. So I don't know what happened, but allowed them to sort of ignore other areas. And that's why a lot of the tribes are quite, quite pissed because mm -hmm. essentially they consulted them at little bits of chunks and it allows you to sort of say, Oh, look, so instead of saying that this is going to affect 200 sites or 500 sites, I have no idea how many historical sites are on this. This is just a, a random thing. You're able to say 200 times it affected or 300 times it affected like one or two sites, which is a lot easier to, um, to get past and also obstructs the general view. So, you know, 1,100 miles is going to have a pretty – pretty big impact across the whole thing. And that usually ends up with you know, pipelines getting moved and, you know, stuff getting rerouted just to miss out on certain sites. But mm -hmm. that's what, that's what I was told. And again, this is all hearsay. So don't quote me on that, but I was told that um, per, that's what permit 12 allows. This allows you to break it up instead of having to do the whole, the whole pipeline. And that might be why there's only something for North Dakota um so if anyone else okay. has a comment on well we'll we'll comment on that just on the other side of the break we'll come back shortly <laughs> Professional Certifications for Scientists, or PCS, aims to provide practical educational videos, field guides, knowledge tests, professional certifications, and employment connections to professional scientists everywhere. Check out the jobs page for job listings in contract archaeology. Post a job for just $50. All of PCS's jobs are verified and checked for completeness. Find PCS jobs at www.pcscourses.com forward slash jobs. PCS, a place for good scientists to become great science professionals. All right, we're back. And Doug was asking a question about um, um, Permit 12 and, and, and what's going on out there. So, Sonia, what's your response to that? So, ac according to the Army Corps' uh, Nationwide Permit 12 just information page, um, if a permit is only supposed to be used if uh, if a, if a, a pr an undertaking has m minimal com uh, individual and cumulative adverse effects on the mm -hmm. aquatic environment. Uh, so, the you know we're we're just talking about the aquatic environment here, not necessarily because that's what the Army Corps is concerned about. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily talking about other. Uh, other adverse effects um, outside of those aquatic environments. Um, I'm not a I'm not an Army Corps specialist in any way, um, and I this permit is a little new to me. Um, I always thought it was for transmission lines, simply because they really don't have as heavy an impact on the ground surface as a building up. 1100 mile 30 inch diameter pipeline does mm -hmm. you know and burying that um so this this uh permit is specific to waters and the aquatic environment not the physical or geographical environment cultural environment um i don't know why they, they um i don't i can't i couldn't tell you why they they um just they just did it in the in, in North Dakota because you're you're crossing the Missouri River you're crossing several other rivers mm -hmm. I'm sure there's probably wetlands in there somewhere I mean we've got North and South Dakota uh, Iowa and Illinois all involved in this pipeline right um, I, I I I can't answer I mean I, I don't I don't know what the what the purpose was and I think that would it would be really helpful to get somebody who has more uh, background with this type of permit on to kind of talk about it right and, and we should do that um, when this kind of settles down a little bit we might take a look back yeah. on it and see what see what where would see as archaeologists where we can learn from it quite frankly um, mm -hmm. but I think I think you know, what we've said so far, it seems to me like one of the biggest issues that the um, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe has, like we've already mentioned, is that they weren't really consulted on the entire um, the entire pipeline as a whole uh, as it crosses land, you know, that they that they have is culturally significant. Um, and they were just we were talking about these little chunks and possibly one reason 
why somebody decided to do that at the Army Corps um, was because of the way um, the land ownership issues that they have. So just looking at the, um, um, the draft environmental assessment again, um, it says class two and class three archaeological survey were conducted within a 400 foot survey corridor um, along a 100 foot wide potential um, stringing corridor, it says, across federal lands. That's across federal lands. Now, um, North Dakota also has a lot of private land. There's a lot of farmland and a lot of ranch land out there. And it said that um, um, invest survey investigations were restricted to those properties where land access was voluntarily given by the landowners. Um, my question is, what about land where it wasn't voluntarily given by the landowners? I guess no survey was done there, and they're just giving an easement and taking their taking their check for the pipeline going through. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm just guessing on that. Um, but it is private land, and we we in this country hold private land quite sacred, so um, uh, more sacred than actual sacred land, I might add. And... Uh, so I don't know, and, and it says in these uh, in these investigations, only eight, only eight previously recorded sites were looked at um, in the uh, in the federal areas that were actually found, um, and they were directly uh, seven were mapped directly adjacent to Lake um, Oahe. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. O a h e um, Ohe or Oahe. I'm not sure. Um, anyway. Basically, what this thing is saying is there's just a handful of paragraphs that discuss the cultural resources that were located, whether they were previously recorded or newly recorded. And according to this entire thing, there wasn't very many. Now, of course, this is still just talking about North Dakota, but it's the area affected by this whole thing. And they're saying, oh, what was found wasn't significant and we didn't find anything else, basically. So, um, but like Stevens already mentioned, um, you know, we should... Uh, you know, we should talk about monitoring. And if, if people are saying that they're bulldozing through um, Native American burial sites, that's a pretty standard thing there. You find a burial, you have an immediate work stoppage for, um, the NAGPRA says, what is it, 30 days minimum? Um, uh, while you contact the authorities, the, the tribes in question, and then you do your consultation and you figure out what to do about it. Um, that's, that's pretty standard. And I'm not sure why that's being allowed to happen. Of course, this is just from information we're getting in the news. So... Chris, you've got some thoughts uh, in the background on this. What's up? Yeah, I mean, it's my thoughts are are still. I'm just scratching my head on why this is treated in sections instead of a single entity. Because, you know, I've worked on interstate projects that were treated as single entities, and they ran across similar issues where, like, Interstate I-85, for example, that went through the Deep South. You know, we hit hundreds of Mississippian burial mounds and you know, we were able to section that off and deal with, you know, culturally sensitive areas and then bring those comments back to the project and the engineering firm that was designing the interstate, you know, worked on mitigation mm -hmm. tactics to get around these sensitive areas. So it's just unusual in my mind that that process apparently didn't happen here. And so there's, there's tax issues maybe i mean like in an interstate project obviously uh taxes are involved but for everything i've been able to look up about the funding structure for dakota access is it's not involving taxes uh it, i mean it could be possible that there are you know some tax credits or subsidies involved in local instances but mm -hmm. Overall, the main complaint about funding seems to stem from a conglomeration of banks and investors, you know, bankrolling this project. And so, you know, that's that's a whole separate conversation outside of archaeology. But, um, you know, that could involve why Permit 12 was enacted and why they're treating it in segments is because of a different funding structure than we're used to looking at in archaeology for a project of this size. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are various complaints about, and Sonia mentioned this in, in the background, there's various complaints about uh, the streamlining of this process. And, you know, essentially, you know, I mean, the articles accuse Michelle Dippel, the liaison for Dakota Access, who's supposed to be coordinating with the Corps and the tribes, uh, you know, in, in various articles, they really drag her through the dirt and... You know, I've heard from people who know her um, as an acquaintance that, you know, she's a really stand-up archaeologist. And this is the kind of thing that could essentially ruin her career. Um, 
mm-hmm. depending on how this plays out. And so, you know, it's it's a shame that all of these uh, all of these issues are coming about. So, I guess my my question is, all right, now that we're looking at what we do know, cultural material was found. Uh, apparently, human burials were found. What do we do now? Does does that trigger Section 106 again, despite anything that was mentioned in the uh, EA or any of the other documents for this program? I mean, like, aren't we aren't we looking at you know bigger federal laws that are in place now to protect human remains, like NAGPRA? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Uh, but perhaps Sonia and Stephen have more um, uh, more on that. And, and yeah, on private property, Sonia is saying in the background, if NAG, NAGPRA does not necessarily apply, but um, uh, it certainly does on the federal end. And I don't know where the burials that have been uh, supposedly uh, bulldozed up, I, I don't know where those where those were located. So not really sure. Um, yeah, I don't either. Yeah. I don't either. If, right. if, if the burials were found on private property or state property or anything like that, NAGPRA does not apply, even if it's a federal project. Mm-hmm. NAGPRA only applies if the burials were found on federal land. Right. So we're back to um, state law, and um, so and and I don't know I, I don't know where the burials were found either. So, and even if there were any, are, I were there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> obviously, I'm not that up to date. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and also, we've got a comment that uh, that Doug found that that pertains to. Uh, separating up the area into 209 separate small APEs rather than one large one, which is one of the um, advisory council uh, advisory council's uh, major discussion points. Um, it said it was a. This is a quote from the thing. It said it was a fast tracking process that was reissued in 2012 via an executive order to help speed up the compliance process for utility and pipeline construction. Um, so basically, what it does is it allows them to split those areas up into smaller APEs and deal with them individually so they can say, okay, that one's easy, that one's easy, that one's easy. It's how a lot of us deal with tasks to begin with. So I can kind of see how they would logically come to this conclusion. Not that it's right, but this is what they did. (laughs) So they would say, and this is how engineers think too. So you can see where this came from, but they'd say, okay, so this area is pretty clear. You know, we're going to do that. That's fine. This one's fine, but this one's a huge mess. Well, we can just deal with that and go around it or we can mitigate it or we can do something and, and we can figure out what we're going to do with that, but we don't have to stop the whole entire pipeline. We can keep on going. We just have this one little area or these two little areas to figure out versus, oh my God, this one thing stopped the entire thing and that's it. So I can see their their thinking behind wanting something like this. I can see um, agencies wanting to fight for something like that because in a lot of cases, maybe it works out. I'm not really sure, but um, it's uh, it's interesting and it clearly didn't work out for them in this case, um, especially because Native Americans, um, the Standing Rock Sioux tribe in particular, they don't see that whole area as little tiny chunks. They see that area as one big, hey, we're from here, and this is important to us, so you guys are going to pay attention to that. And that's kind of what we're dealing with, you know? Yeah, and then to aggravate their point even even further is sectioning up this project into little bits like that, they saw the the dakota access project you know it was like they stopped in the area where the the protesters were directly acting but construction on the other sections of the pipeline where there were not protesters was continuing Mm -hmm. and so you know that was really aggravating them even further in you know the the comments they were releasing to media and all that okay well um yeah let's um do we have any other thoughts on this, guys? Um, as to, uh, I, I'd kind of like to know. Um, I, I guess if you were handed a huge pipeline like this as a as a project manager, um, and I'm speaking more specifically probably to Stephen and uh, Sonia at this point because you may have done these things, um, or or at least given a huge area. What do you think about this uh, specifically the the splitting up into little pieces? If that was a, a legally advisable um, a, a legal route that you can take, or maybe your agency, the permitting agency, said this is what you're going to do, how would you deal with that? Would you um, would you still try to look at the consultation, the, the archaeological aspect as okay, we'll break this up into little areas and then use the consultation side and say okay, tribes, um, here's the whole entire area. This is what we've got going on. You know, um, uh, how would you, how would you do that? Um, yeah, basically, uh, like if that's the, 
direction that the agency wants to go mm -hmm. and you know and, and that's a legal direction you know like it's it's not like a you know we're kind of sidestepping everything um then I, in in some ways it's like we would be foolish not to use it um that mm -hmm. you know this, this is that you know programmatic agreements and and streamlined processes are part of the business and for the very point of they're designed to get the job done and maybe cost the taxpayers less mm -hmm. or at least the agents less or and and you know speed things up so you're not you know slowing down you know progress or you know costing you know the proponent a lot of money right that you know like um you know and, and which actually makes me think of like a potential follow-up topic that we talked about but <laughs> um I, you know so so yeah we we would you know like uh as far as compartmentalizing it we do that anyway um those of us who've you know worked on a large project you tend to break it down into analytical chunks um and and if you are dealing with um uh, discrete stream crossings you, you would address them separately you, mm -hmm. you you know your your report would break down like you know stream crossing one stream crossing two stream crossing three uh, um you know because they're not contiguous they're not the same pro you know property um as far as like you know in a real estate sense um that you know the ar the archaeology at one crossing is going to be different than at another um even if they're you know culturally related uh but yeah when when, when it moves over to consultation it, it that that kind of changes things because you're not talking about archaeological sites at that point i mean you might be but you, you it becomes a lot more of a landscape sort of thing and you're dealing with other aspects that, that the nation might be interested in um you know, like that um under nipa uh sacred sites are defined a little bit differently than they are under uh, nhpa uh the national historic preservation act that um you, you know where nhpa it, it's it's has to have like a historical component to it that, that's not not really the case with nipa um so you can be dealing with a different variety of um types of pro properties um or resources that you know need to be considered well sonia in the last couple of minutes here before you've got to go um what are your thoughts on that for as a as a project manager as a as a project manager, I I um, generally tend to be more of a lumper than a splitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I tend to want to uh, address the pipeline as a whole, and then, in the case of these these small little variations, um, then then they're they're fine to use. I think um, in in terms of oh we need a little reroute here, we need a little bit more easement there for a staging area, or oh we need to put in an additional junction, so we need to add a little bit of property here. Those are fine, and and I totally see you know you know 209 or however many was uh, PCNs as as a uh, as acceptable for these really long like 1,100 mile projects, but segmenting the entire project that way, um, saying we've got 20 miles here, we've got 40 miles there, that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, like I said, I tend to be more of a lumper than a splitter. Um, I understand, I mean, in that, that context, breaking up the, the project into these small little PCNs, I understand why that may have been done if that right. was in case what, what the situation was. Um, I just don't think that it adequately addresses, um, NEPA, mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, section 106. Or uh, I, I, I feel that way. That's my personal view on that. Um, now, if I were more intimately tied to the project, maybe my attitude would change. I, I don't have all the details, so I don't know. I know that sounds like me fence riding, but <laughs> I'm not part of the project. <laughs> yeah. Well, in just the last minute here before we go to break again um, and before Sonia leaves us, I'll just mention, I, I think actually it is um, 
it is it is within the the purview of section 106 to to discuss it like that it's not just opinion or how we would do things because i've worked on um at least a handful of natural gas sites when natural gas was at a higher price and they were crazy going for it here in nevada um and these natural gas sites basically consist of a single access road that takes you out to a drill platform that's usually maybe a hundred to a couple hundred feet square um and then there's uh there's often a big deep um uh, water retention hole there. And then they've got the, the wellhead right next to it. So we had to monitor a lot of those, but in some cases, um, the company would have us survey the entire area, like a block survey. Um, but in a lot of cases we would just survey the area where the pad was going to be, where the well was going to be and the, the access road to that pad. And then the primary road that went through there, um, was either previously surveyed or, you know, we would survey that as well. So we do these little chunks and not as separate projects, but as one project. So when you look at these little things, and you're consulting with um, the local tribes and you say, oh, well, this is just this tiny little pad. It's not going to do anything. But Section 106 t- says that we need to take into account all of the impacts on a project area. And when you have one little well pad in a valley in the middle of nowhere in Nevada, that might, do- that might not do anything. But when you stand back on a hillside and you look down at this valley that might be sacred to somebody and you see 150 well pads and trucks and the dust that they create and the uh and the uh you know the pipelines associated with those if they're piping it out and and all the little things that are involved in this now it's a, a network of craziness that have just culturally and sick and from a sacred standpoint destroyed that area so that's a visual impact it's an auditory impact it's um it has um it has lots of impacts so i don't know how you could not take the cultural significance of an area as a whole even if you broke the project area up into chunks i don't know how you couldn't take the whole thing as a whole and look at the impacts from section 106 if you didn't do that you didn't satisfy section 106 as far as i'm concerned so let's take a break and we'll come back and finish this up hi everyone this is Christopher Dorr with Heritage Business International, and here's this week's Heritage Business Tip from the Archive. This week, we look at where your firm stands in relation to your competitors. Know and track your market share. If you track your organization's performance through time by dollars, pounds, or euros, you may appear to be growing, but actually be losing market share to your competitors. Calculating market share is easy. Just take your organization's top line earnings and divide it by the size of the market. In the United States, for example, the architectural restoration and renovation sector of the heritage industry is about $3.5 billion per year. If you work for an architectural heritage firm with top line revenue of $5.2 million, you would have about two tenths of a percent of market share. Lots of room for growth. To receive our most up-to-date heritage business tips, you can subscribe to our free weekly email at heritagebusiness.org. Until next time, this is Christopher Dorr. All right, we're back for our final segment. Um, like we mentioned at the beginning, Sonia had to leave us to go to some other volunteer activities today. So I um, uh, hope she has good luck with that. So anyway, we're going to wrap this up. Um, like we said at the beginning, we're not experts on this. We have no direct influence on it. None of us were part of this process. So we're in the same boat that you guys are for the most part, is that we're taking all this information in from various news sources, social media, Twitter, whatever we have. And we're trying to form an opinion over over you know how we would do things. But we have to keep in mind that Every single thing out there has a bias to it, okay? Um, Every single news article that was written by a person has a bias that is either that person's bias or that publication's bias. And usually, I think a person would work for a publication if they shared the same views, but that's not always the case. Um, So there's a bias there. And then if you saw this, let's just use Facebook as an example, because that's where a lot of people get their news these days. Um, If if a friend posted that on Facebook, chances are that friend probably... um, probably either agrees with the article that they're posting or they'll post why they don't agree with the article that they're posting. But either way, there's a bias to their reason for posting that. So we have to keep all that in mind and understand that none of us really have the big picture. Um, I always give um, the archaeological firm and the agency um, the benefit of the doubt because when I say, quote unquote, the agency, it's easy to hate on that. 
But I mean, I have plenty of friends on Facebook and Twitter that now work for agencies or that have always worked for agencies. And they're, they're who we're talking about. They're the archaeologists that started from the, from the bottom as a field tech and did shovel bumming and then finally got this dream job as an, at an agency with a salary and benefits and, you know, a handy green uniform or whoever they're working for. And, uh, and, and that's, that's who we're talking about. That's who had this project thrown on their desk a year or two ago and said, hey, deal with this. Um, you know, that's, uh, this is your deal now. And now that person is, you know, probably stressed out and freaking out and going, what the hell did I do? Did I do something wrong? You know, what the hell, what the hell? So, you know, we got to keep in mind that there are, there is a human aspect to this. Now the, um, there's another bias too. the Dakota access pipeline folks. Um, I mean, they're, they're a corporation They're They also have bias. They, they want to put a pipeline in, they're beholden to their investors. They've probably got billions of dollars wrapped up in this. Who knows how much money, and, you know, they're doing whatever they can to get this pipeline through. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of players in this. Um, but that's, I, I try to give the agencies and the, and the archaeologists involved sort of the benefit of the doubt, because I think for the most part, people will try to do what they think is right. Um, and, and I think, I think most people would agree with that. But uh, anyway, what are you guys' final, final thoughts on this subject, Stephen? Um, yeah, th- I have quite a few, uh, <laughs> you know, like, like you say, um, I, I think that I, I've, for the most part on, on social media and, and everything, I, I've been fairly quiet about this whole thing. Um, just kind of sitting back and, and watching it. Cause it's, it's really hard to know, you know, where the actual failures were, mm-hmm. um, until they come out, uh, you, you know, like through actual internal investigation or, um, you know, judicial findings or whatever mm-hmm. um but for the most part that it, it's entirely possible that you know you know there, there's clearly a failure here this you know this this is stuff that shouldn't have happened right but for all i can tell that failure is is one of process that you know because they were using uh like a streamlined process that was perhaps designed for a different sort of thing, transmission lines, um, that maybe they were using the wrong tool for the job. Maybe, you know, in con- consultation didn't quite work out the way that they wanted. Like, did they ask the wrong questions? Did they not ask questions that really needed to be asked? Um, is it is the issue that because the core really only has a mandate for certain areas that, they were willing to, you know, like they stayed in their own lane. They they did their job. They made sure that, you know, their particular areas of interest were covered, but nobody was really watching, you know, watching the show for the whole thing. Um, you know, in, in, in the, in the end, um, I, I'm, you know, and I want to point this out because I mentioned this at the beginning that, you know, they, they were apparently, uh, in, uh, filings for injunctions and to get the pipeline construction to stop. Well, you know, this is kind of sorted through and, and that really didn't happen. But then the um, various agencies, uh, department of justice, um, department of army and, and uh, department of interior, the ACHP, um, they, you know, sat down and they're like, okay, well, we're going to, you know, take a step back and look at this process and figure out what, you know, what went wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that in a certain way that that's much better outcome, um, from this than just having like a court ordered stop. Um, because, you know, with any luck, this will adjust that streamlined process and, and maybe find a better balance where things like this don't fall through the cracks. Yeah. Good point. Doug. I am going to take a slightly different tact and even, uh, I, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I'm not even sure if the process had gone through perfectly that you wouldn't still have this problem. Mm-hmm. And that, and this is sort of the a bigger critique of the process of Section 106 and our laws is a lot of what you're seeing is sort of a grassroots um, protest against the pipeline. And that's a massive sort of social movement of people who 
feel as though their opinions were not taken into account. And I'm not actually sure Section 106 or any of our, our processes would have actually reached those people. Because mm -hmm. in a sense, whenever we do consultation, we do consultation with recognized groups. So we will go and do consultation with federally recognized tribes. But there's many tribes that aren't federally recognized and that are usually not included in that process. And then you're talking tribal politics in which certain people will say, yes, you consulted us, whereas you've talked to maybe one or two or maybe a dozen people in the tribe, and there could be several hundred, and they could actually be quite pissed. And it happens a lot when we go on to private land. Like, you, you run into ranchers and farmers who are not at all happy to see us <laughs> there. Right. And, and even no matter what we do, and the project's going ahead. I mean, eminent domain, they'll, they'll take the land, they're, they're going to build their project. Um, we're part of that process. But there's a lot of people who, at the end of any of these processes, are not happy. And fair enough, that is, that's life. You always negotiate with everything, and not everyone gets what they want. But mm -hmm. in this case, I think even if they had gone through the whole process, you might still have a lot of these protests. And it has a lot to do not with archaeology, but with deeper historical um, clusterfucks that have happened with <laughs> local <laughs> groups. Um, and this is just the, the latest version of that same fight that's been going on for several hundred years. And, you know, even if we'd done everything perfect and parts of the tribe had signed off on it, you still could have this. Mm -hmm. And I think you could have this in any other neighborhood at any time. And it's always interesting when you're going through these processes of archaeology. In a sense, we're supposed to go there and identify what is quote-unquote historical and sometimes it gets real political. A lot of times archaeology will be used to block, you know, neighborhoods don't want those rich condos to be built and, you know, people to come in and change the neighborhood. And so archaeology is used as a way to prevent that, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily caring too much about the archaeology. So you're talking about all these different political things. And I'm not sure that actually we have figured out a good process where we actually reach, you know, a lot of the people who are affected by these different projects. We basically talk to other agency people who say, yes, that is okay or that's not okay, but that's not actually really reaching out to a lot of the people who are affected, um, mm -hmm. at least in my personal opinion. Maybe you guys disagree. I think Doug has a lot of good points there. And despite all the outcomes of the Dakota Access Pipeline, I think that there are a lot of good lessons we can learn or at least lessons we can learn um and i think that there are some some positives that have come out of all of this and one of one of those is uh like the power of social media uh as kind of an activist tool and so you know the the role of archaeologists and the role of engineers and all that you know objectively is not to be an activist group uh, you know, it, it's like Doug said, we go into it, we abide by all the laws, and ultimately we're beholden to satisfy our client. And so if the client is Dakota Access and we're working, we're working under the assumption that the pipeline will be built. But I think that the outcome of the Dakota Access pipeline is that there were other voices, there were other groups that absolutely did not want that outcome they want they did not want the pipeline to be built period mm -hmm. and for a variety of different reasons including archaeological and cultural reasons and so i think moving forward some of our lessons could be you know that there's a problem with how we interpret section 106 or, you know, not archaeologists in general. I think there's a problem with how agencies interpret Section 106. And to bring back Stephen's point earlier, you know, D Dakota Access is, is an example of using the wrong tools for the job. 
And so this is a really good opportunity to come back to large scale projects like this and look at what the most appropriate tools for the job are. And then also remember that we are also anthropologists and that there are bigger things at play. So like cultural areas that might be better addressed through NEPA rather than section 106 or NHPA. And, you know, also aside from our role as archeologists, I think that, you know, as a totally separate point, I think that the largest gathering of Native Americans in hundreds of years is an amazing and beautiful thing. And I think that it's awesome. You know, it sucks that if there was cultural destruction involved, but I think it's awesome that uh, their sovereignty and their voice is being recognized on a national level and that the general public, you know, finally gives a shit about them. And mm -hmm. also that our role as archaeologists you know, we, whether we love it or not, we've been thrown into the middle as archaeologists, as, you know, kind of an activist force. And so now people are like caring about what we find in our jobs. And so like, I've seen a lot of think pieces and little articles, like, this is what archaeologists do. This is like public archaeology. And so there's so many opportunities moving forward to, you know, be more involved in different cultural aspects as archaeologists and also to present more of a public archaeology through all of this. So, you know, a lot of bad things happen, but I think that there's a lot of good opportunities. Nice. Good points. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to wrap this up just in the last couple of minutes here uh, and, and just say, uh, you know, we, we have to be careful in this process because there, there are a lot of people out there that are trying to, um, you know, probably the Dakota Access Pipeline people would be my guess would be the types of people that do this. But there are a lot of people trying to um, take away the National Historic Preservation Act or at least change it in a way that would that would significantly impact our field. And things like this, like Chris said, they do bring all this into the limelight and get people to actually critically look at it, which they should. I mean, if it's not working, it's not working. Um, but it, but I think I think when done properly, which is the, the problem that we've discussed here, when done properly, the Section 106 process is actually um, effective, and uh, but but that's the thing. It's a complicated thing. There's a lot to it. I mean, there's entire courses that take a week just to understand it. Um, you know, Tom King has made a living on on uh, on writing books about the Section 106 process and and unpacking that document. And this is Section 106, as we've mentioned before, is a single paragraph in the National Historic Preservation Act and NHPA is an act that would have a difficult time, if not impossible time, getting through legislation if it were to be enacted today. So um, the fact that this was done in 1966 is to our benefit, um, but and, and it's been amended since then um, a couple times. But, uh, you know, I just, I, I just want to caution people when they're looking at this and say, have the, have the big picture, have the big overview, and realize that it's not always the big bad laws and regulations that are bad. It's the execution of those laws, and it's how they all interact with each other that are sometimes, um, you know, disastrous to a project's outcome. Uh, I, I encourage everyone to read the book uh, by Darby Stapp, um, uh, "Avoiding Archaeological Disasters." There's some <laughs> there's some good stuff in there and some good lessons. And if he ever does a second version of that, I'm guessing this this the Dakota Access Pipeline will be in it. So because um, it's probably one of the biggest uh, archaeological and cultural disasters that we've seen uh, in recent years. So anyway, I think we're going we're gonna to stop this there. Um, we're, we're on tap to have the uh, California um, Cultural Resource Preservation Alliance um, on uh, one of our next podcasts, so take a look at that, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash CRM Arc Podcast. If you like the show and want to comment, please do. You can leave comments about this or any other episode on the website or on the iTunes page for the episode. You can also email me at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com or use the contact form on the podcast webpage. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or tweet your questions with the hashtag CRM Arc Podcast, or you can tag at ArcPodNet in your tweet. Please share the link to the show wherever you saw it. 
If you share CRM archaeology related items on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else for that matter, be sure to use the hashtag CRMARC so the community can see and comment. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio. You can also type the name of the podcast into your favorite podcasting app and subscribe that way. Don't forget to go over to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It helps us get noticed so more people can find our podcast and benefit from the content. Also, send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Also, please consider donating to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Your donations help fund our bandwidth and contribute to our editing costs. Thanks to everyone for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you in the field. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Adios. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.